I was far from being a farm kid, but I still had more exposure to agriculture than most. I grew up visiting my great-grandparents still living on our family's homestead in Southeast Missouri. By that time, they were renting out the land, the chicken house was empty, the cow for milking was long gone, and the vegetable garden was no more than an overgrown asparagus patch. But I still grew up jumping from hay bale to hay bale in the barn, going for tractor rides and planting summer gardens. And the stories of my family remained firmly rooted in the land that was my childhood playground. And when I wasn't in the countryside, I was living in the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis was a company town, and one of the biggest global agribusinesses was headquartered there. Many family members and family friends made a living by working in the ag industry. Yet despite all this, and the rows and rows of corn that I rode past most weekends, I never thought much about how food got to my table. And then when I left Missouri and landed on the East Coast for college, I unexpectedly found myself diving into the world of food and ag. I was in an environmental leadership seminar my freshman year and had a professor who approached agriculture from an environmental and humanities perspective. I don't remember the exact words, but I remember hearing, all big ag is evil and it has to be all small scale organic. This was a complete shift from the rhetoric I'd heard growing up. In fact, organic was the dirty word in our house, as I was taught it was just a marketing scheme out to vilify big ag. From that lecture onward, I became obsessed with understanding the nuances of our food and agriculture system. I wanted to know enough to parse through the information myself and make my own informed decisions about how I thought food should get to my plate. So I got to work. I started volunteering on farms, finding related internships, and working on a thesis project that involved interviewing stakeholders across the industry. Farmers, chefs, executives of big ag companies, environmental groups. Yet after all this, I still felt like our commodity agriculture system was a mystery. So after school, I went to work for an agriculture technology startup that was using farm data to assess best practices on commodity grain farms. I continued to build my knowledge and understanding as I moved from Philadelphia to South Dakota to San Francisco to Michigan. Little by little through farmer conversations, learning about grain markets and trading, and reading the farm bill, a more complete picture came into focus. In today's talk, I'm gonna paint a picture of our modern day agri-food system using a couple of main principles. Disclaimer that this is a vast oversimplification of an incredibly complex system. First, the building block of everything else is efficiency. Since the Green Revolution, also known as the Agricultural Revolution, we've had a high inputs to high yields model, meaning that we're focused on how we squeeze the most crop out of each acre. In order to achieve this goal, we rely on copious amounts of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Rather than encouraging farmers to build sustainable businesses, they're largely encouraged to maximize yield on a handful of crops, no matter the cost. There are shows like Corn Wars that laud farmers for growing the most bushels per acre. Less talked about is the amount of fertilizer required to achieve those yields. And this doesn't account for any of the externalities of farming practices like algal blooms from phosphorus runoff, soil depletion, erosion, or water use. And it's not lost on me that the more chemicals and fertilizers that a farmer buys, the more agriculture companies profit. But it's no accident that efficiency is our building block. The Green Revolution began after World War II in developed countries and spread globally to the late 1980s. The development of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, along with other technological advances, has played a significant role in reducing starvation, but it has had its unintended consequences. With efficiency as our building block, we've ended up with a system that can be characterized by monoculture, meaning we're often only growing one or two crops in a field. According to the 2017 US Ag Census, corn, soy, and wheat cover about 64.7% of harvested cropland acres. Corn and soy alone cover 56.6. And you can even see this impact on our plates. Even though grocery stores are bigger than ever before and we think we're eating a diverse diet, when it comes down to it, 
worldwide, the majority of our food calories come from three staple crops, rice, wheat, and corn. And even though there are over 30,000 edible plant species, today we only grow about 170 crops on a commercially significant scale. Think about what fills your plate. What crops make up your diet? Growing the same crop year after year results in soil degradation, increased pest pressure, and a reliance on synthetic inputs to continue farming the land. This efficiency focus has also led us to a grain-based system. We love to use grain for a lot of things, but food. 40% of the US corn crop is used for ethanol production, and 77% of soybeans are used for livestock, meat, and dairy feed. And just 55% of the world's crop calories are directly eaten by people. Big Ag loves to tout the feed the world message, but when it comes down to it, a lot of our cropland is actually not going directly for food. And America's love of cheap meat has resulted in a grain-based system built to churn out animal protein with efficiency, but with grave environmental and animal welfare concerns. Finally, this efficiency focus has also led us to consolidation. There are now only four big seed and chemical companies running the show, controlling 60% of global proprietary seed sales. There are also only four big meat packers. 55 to 85% of all beef, pork, and poultry sold in the US run through these companies. And consolidation can even be seen as it relates to individual farms. Small family farms are slowly being pushed out. Bigger is better in mechanized agriculture when the equipment and farm infrastructure needs can run up a bill in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Ultimately, this consolidation leads to a number of issues, including rural flight and lost knowledge of the land. So to summarize, we have a system that's been built to prioritize efficiency above all else. Again, I've not forgotten that this is what's allowed us to feed the world up to this point. But it's been built with many short-sighted solutions. If we're going to see the level of change we need in our agriculture system, it calls for a fundamentally different approach. As Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So rather than efficiency as our focus, what about resilience? Resilience can be defined as the capacity to withstand or recover quickly from difficulties, tending to adjust easily to misfortune or change. I believe the foundation of resilience is required to feed a world full of more extreme weather events, wars interrupting global trade, and global pandemics. The past couple of years have shown us just how fragile our food system can be. We need to rebuild regional food production and processing, encourage diversification of crops, explore perennial systems rather than annual cycles, and change the way that food gets from farm to plate. Our focus on efficiency cannot go away altogether, but it can no longer be prioritized above all else. A system built to be resilient transforms our concentrated monoculture system into regionalized diverse production. We need to create new opportunities for farmers to grow new and different types of crops. Farmers don't see opportunities other than growing what other commodity crop can be sold at their local elevator. If we can create these new markets, we give farmers another viable path to continue their way of life in a changing agricultural landscape. Let's tap into the known 30,000 edible plant species out there. Like this freshly planted agroforestry system of chestnut and fruit trees here. Or these yellow field peas, which have been a new crop added back into many grain farmers' rotations given the rise of plant-based proteins. And U.S. ag policy plays a big role in shaping our food system. Sweeping policy change can encourage diversification and regionalization that will lead to a more resilient system. We need ag policies to encourage climate-friendly farming practices and commodity and production outside of the commodity agriculture system. 
we need to overhaul our federally subsidized crop insurance program, primarily issued only for a handful of commodity crops. Some promising priorities for the upcoming farm bill include more support for small and mid-sized producers, expanding conservation programs, and more opportunities for rural entrepreneurship. This is a picture of a packed house on a Michigan white winter night on a meeting for expanding local meat processing infrastructure. We must show up for these events. And eaters, we're not off the hook. A fundamental shift in our food system requires all of us to be on board because our decisions three times a day, every day, hold a lot of power. So what if we started eating more beans rather than meat for one or two meals a week? Or what about adding chestnuts to our diet, which is a permanent tree crop, and with more domestic demand could possibly increase agroforestry adoption across the US? Finally, this shift will require a changed mindset from all of us, including from the existing commodity agriculture system. In 2021, when large car companies started making commitments to exclusively offer electric vehicles in the coming years, I ran a quick search to see what response the agricultural community was having. Remember when I mentioned that 40% of the US corn crop goes to ethanol production? There were headlines popping up like, electrification of cars will hurt farmers, and large agribusiness CEOs were speaking out against this announcement. But today's farmers and ag companies have to accept that change is coming. Rather than pushing back against it, plan for it, embrace it, and innovate with change in mind. I recently read an article with the title, We Are Out of Farmland. This article went on to ask how we can possibly increase the production and efficiency of current agricultural land to feed a growing population. However, I would argue with resilience in mind, a different set of additional questions pop up, like how do we reduce food waste? How do we create alternatives to synthetic fertilizer? How do we eat more efficiently? How do we farm in ways that actually put carbon back into the soil and build it up rather than break it down? In closing, a less than 15 minute talk cannot possibly summarize our food and agriculture system and the fundamental change that we need to see. And none of the solutions I've shared with you today are magic switches that can be flipped on overnight. But the answer to seeing this change is not to ignore it and it's not to villainize the status quo. The answer to seeing this change is to recognize our food and agriculture system for what it is, a complex system that is so core to who we are as humans. To see this change, we all have a role in playing a part to make it a reality because we all have an invested stake in the future of our agriculture industry. Because after all, according to Wendell Berry, farmer and poet, eating is an agricultural act. Thank you.